Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my show Rocket Monday. In today's episode, we're going to talk about reaction control system. So let's dive right into it. Well, first you have to understand space itself. Well, what is it? To simplify that there is nothing in it. That's the whole reality of it. There is nothing. It's a void. That is why we call it vacuum. So you have nothing. So what does that mean for anything that you send in space? Be it International Space Station, be it Dragon Capsule, be it BFR. What does it mean for them? Well, you cannot have what we classify as control surfaces. If you are familiar with aircraft, a uh, heck, have you ever seen any aircraft? You must have seen what we classify as control surfaces. Basically, things like uh, at the end, uh, you know, end of uh, your airplane wings, uh, their tail, and all that. All these things provide control that's why we call them control surfaces now they work on simple principle of action equals reaction but they react against atmosphere once you are in space there is no atmosphere so you cannot do that anything like with it basically you can have a, a space plane that goes that high but here's the deal once you are in that space you have no control basically you can't do anything it will, you, it will be like flapping your hand and nothing will happen so uh, we cannot employ normal surface control now is it important well think of it this way let's say international space station is there and if it has no way of controlling itself how the heck it's gonna align the solar panels perfectly to the sun and during the night time basically night time of iss when it goes into earth's shadow uh, they align the solar panel in the same plane as orbit so basically they make it perpendicular to perpendicular is wrong word, parallel to the orbit there so it has less drag they have to do this every like you know every orbit which is like multiple times a day so you can understand that it is very critical on top of that let's say talk uh, talk about geostation which is literally on top of this and uh, that is like thirty six thousand kilometer and all that that also has to maintain its solar panels because yes dish can be focusing directly on earth so that's awesome nothing to that but it has to rotate the solar panel uh, so it can always face the sun and uh, other things also is required when you have to little bit of thrust you have to have in order to maintain your orbit uh, which is called orbit uh, raising maneuvers so you can understand that and generally orientation is classified in three rotational axes we have roll when you are rolling like this then you have pitch that's why we said a nose pitch up pitch down pitch up and all that and then you have yaw yaw is the hardest to remember it's like something like that so these are the three rotational axes and you cannot achieve this uh, using normal engine simple because normal engine is designed to either push you forward or push you backwards that's it it's a, it has simple axis like that it's like either this or this you can again orient it in such a way that you have to get this axis also but without uh, basically this rotational control you have no uh, way of doing it basically if your engine is backward all you can do is go forwards so th this is why this three control is very important because if you have these three control you can aim your uh, rear engine whatever way you want like let's say you want to flip and burn you can do like this and flip and burn it what uh, basically falcon 9 stage 1 booster does flip and burn maneuver so you have to understand there are some serious problem with uh, space well so what is the solution physics is very simple action equals reaction same mathematics that we apply on rockets it can be applied here it's the third law of motion you cannot break it so if you have a uh, but side effect is that you need a reaction mass of it basically you have to carry something that you're going to dump in vacuum of space and it will not come down with you again again you will always carry extra and you will be like okay this mission did not require that many correction and all that jar. it could happen but here's the it's not coming back with you. it's like a propellant that you are spending in space so you need that mass so how much energy you can get out of it basically let's say you have to turn a 20 ton spacecraft uh, let's say dragon capsule is less than that but let's say 20 ton versus so if you have to turn let's say 60 ton of space shuttle or versus something in future let's say bfr which is even heavier than that how the heck you gonna get that so you have two control factors basically you can throw a lot basically th uh, mass uh, higher the mass the more reaction you get that's a simple on top of that you can throw it at higher speed basically one kilogram sent at mark one will give you a certain amount of push one kilogram sent at uh, mark two will give you double the push actually it will uh, cube that so you get the idea so either you send a lot of mass or you send at a very high speed that will equal the higher push now generally you want higher speed not higher mass simply because that is an extra propellant that you are carrying it's not a payload it's not gonna pay you for uh, okay uh, you, you are sending a satellite and uh, also this 100 ton payload they're not gonna pay spacex for that so it directly cuts away from the main budget of the spacecraft like uh, in lunar module they have to have like multiple of these systems so the propellant has to be designed in such a way that instead of uh, relying on like you know instead of sending hundreds of kilo send few kilos but send it at very fast speed so you get higher control and these are basically miniature rockets the physics is very simple it is a rocket and it's oriented in such a way that it acts differently but it is a miniature rocket 
so that's the physics of it so how does it work let's talk about the engineering aspect of it well generally there are completely different requirement for these rocket versus when you are talking about the main engine rockets because these are generally monopropellant why monopropellant well monopropellant simply means it's mono you don't have to carry two separate tanks you have only one tank and that's it your main propellant tank and monopropellants are generally very reactive so if you have let's say a monopropellant in tank number one and you have to send it to engine if you send it there and if you have let's say a catalyst bed or a heating element because uh, generally monopropellants have a ignition temperature kind of so if you are like freezing it to minus 500 degrees or say it's not 500 degrees like below absolute zero but you get the idea like in space it can go that cold so you have to make sure that it is heated so generally they will have either heated bed or Catalyst bed. Generally, catalyst bed is preferred because it's 100% temperature. Uh, you know, uh, it will not care about the temperature. So you can be like, you know, dark side of uh, basically Earth and be like, why I'm saying Earth? Basically, in the shadow of Earth, and you, your temperature won't go as low as absolute zero. But if you have not absolute zero, it's just like close to that, and if, uh, catalyst will still work. So generally, people use catalyst bed rather than heating bed. Again, depending on your requirement, because catalyst are generally either palladium or platinum. Those are very expensive. So people sometimes use heated batteries. We're just gonna heat the propellant in the engines. And once it's heated up, you don't have to do anything. It's like self-fulfilling reaction. So that is the whole reality. We want monopropellant. We don't want to carry hundreds of things. We just want to have one simple solution. They are generally pressure fed. It's not necessary, but generally they are pressure fed. So this is a reaction control system of space shuttle. Again, it used to pull double duty. That is why it's so big and beefy. Now you can, this is the fuel tank. Now what the heck is this spherical tank? Now that tank is pressurized gas. We simply pressure feed it. Because if you are familiar with all any of my videos about rocket engines, rocket engines are different from flamethrower why because the fuel and oxidizer that has been burned is been burned at high pressure and let it through a nozzle that gives you the thrust because if you're not pressurizing the fuel all you're gonna get is a basically gas stove with a very expensive fuel so how the heck you take that gas stove turn it into a rocket engine you pressurize it pressurizing is a it in generally you know main engines are done through turbochargers those are very expensive complicated ludicrously expensive here is just a tank. It's just like a 600 psi or 1200 psi, whatever have you, like whatever uh, you know, uh, gas you are familiar with. Generally, we use helium because it's non-reactive. So we use that to pressurize it. It's just pressure-fed engine. Everything about the system has to be simple. Now I told you, like main engines, we we built main engines with completely different uh, thought process. Man, this on the other hand, reaction control system has to be simple. So you can ignite it as many times as you want. It has to be small because you will put it everywhere in the system. Basically, this is a reaction control engine for Gemini uh, capsule. So you can see, like it's literally small, like it's literally this size. So simple, small, and it has to be liquidified because solid boosters, while they are very powerful for emergency abort, they do not have a control system where you can, uh, you know, properly finesse your way into things. It's a flat out, it's a blunt instrument. You need a precision instrument here. So long-term storage and restartability are the two secondary components that you must worry about. Now, long-term storage is different for satellites versus uh, spacecraft because spacecraft is like, okay, it's gonna go into ISS, it's gonna dock there. In less than six months, it's gonna come back. So that's one period when you are talking about satellite let's say a geostationary satellite you could be talking about like 10 years and it must have that propellant uh, working at the end so it can do what, uh, do what we call deorbiting burn not deorbiting for a geostationary, geostationary it like graveyard burn basically it's gonna increase its orbital speed and send it upwards so you can understand like it must be long term storable that means you cannot use cryogenic system even in vacuum space your uh, liquid methane your liquid oxygen is gonna boil away again very slowly but it will and in case of uh, months or years you will lose most of your propellant so flat out it is uh, you cannot use cryogenics and restartable now this is a very critical thing anybody who's following spacex development must have seen how many rockets they lost simply because they ran out of t-tap they were using t-tap for ignition system and uh, in the modern Raptor engine they are using electrical system again there are many things in a normal engine these things have to be much more simpler than that so generally they have either heating element for uh, heat activated system or catalyst pair where they don't even have to do anything they just have to open a valve and that's it nothing else that's your valve is the main control system no turbochargers no ignition system nothing so that's how the engineering side of it works so how do we implement it? Okay, we got the engine, it is small, it is compact, you have uh, its independent fuel system and all that. How do we implement it? 
well we place nozzles everywhere and you generally want the nozzle as far apart as possible why basically think of this way if you, this is your mask and you you have to rotate it let's say you have to align it to something let's say ISS and if somebody puts gives you thruster here you don't have that much leverage but somebody gives you here you can turn it very easily that is why uh, generally the nozzles for thrust control are generally clustered everywhere basically you will see at the edges they will all you will rarely see it in the center you will always see it at the edges that is the primary reason for that you want the maximum torque you can get for minimum amount of thrust and it also slows it down because you can't have free lunch it also slows it down which gives computer enough time to react it's like because rockets are not that precise instrument it's not like okay one gram of it's not electromagnet where like okay one ampere will do this two ampere it's like there is a bit of fudge factor so we place nozzle everywhere and generally we try to spread it out for uh, maximum control so if you are seeing the live footage of this and videos are available where uh, dragon 2 is uh, docking on its own you can see like if you are watching the video you will see many times like multiple of like uh, you know light thrusters and computer is trying to gently uh, lay it down because again i told you if it hits it uh, both of them will be destroyed iss and dragon capsule and if you uh, can ever find high resolution images of uh, space shuttle you will enjoy like how many uh, uh, thrusters it had again it was a big craft like physically big and physically heavy also so it had like thrusters everywhere and many in the during the launch those will be covered so it reduces the aerodynamic drag so that is the implementation of it now again do not confuse draco engines with these engines because draco engines is made for either landing a boat or uh, slow down and things of that nature it's like, not a reactionary control system draco is much more powerful for that you want something precise it's like uh, how in microscope if you have used in school you must see there is one knob that is like you know big and clunky and moves a lot and then you have a small knob that is like you know fine-tune it same thing rc uh, reaction control systems are fine-tuning agents so what we can expect in the future well uh, simply put uh, right now our biggest concern is regarding the fuel the fuel is flat out not very stable again different types of fuel are used for satellite versus uh, what is used for spacecrafts but you can understand you must have seen people are keep calling it like there is a six month limit six month limit six month limit that is because of the fuel fuel are generally corrosive corrosive to the metal that is in the tank so basically that simply means over a period of time tank will start to erode and it will become contaminated enough that engine thrust will be below a certain point or it will flat out explode so uh, there is a limit to that we want a stable fuel that's our requirement number one uh, requirement number two is a low corrosivity for the same thing like you, you want your spacecraft to be docked to iss for years on end you have to have something like that and now uh, another uh, fear of that is that uh, normal uh, Basically, if you have very complicated chemistry change, it is inherently unstable. And when you are talking about space environment, you, especially if you are talking about something that will be in space for 10 years or something like that, you have to worry about uh, radiation and all that. Radiation can also break them apart and sometimes can cause blast and all that. So stability becomes another concern for that. You cannot use something too super duper complicated because new, uh, basically high energy particles from space will destroy it. Now better throttle. Right now I specified in the early 1980s and 1960s and something like that, we did not have computers that were in gigahertz. So flat out computers were like way too slow. So reaction control was like, I'm already too fast for this. But nowadays our computer can make at least 500 adjustments. Like it can send data like to actuators and all that is like, okay bro, do this and that. Less, more than 500 times per second. Problem, our throttle is not that good. Basically, at this point, our computers are ahead, but throttles are not. So you can't be like, okay, uh, give me one Newton, give me 0.5 Newton. It's like, okay, give me 10 Newton, then it's gonna wait for like, you know, okay, let it fade out. Now again, give me two Newtons. Okay, you gave me three Newton. Okay, I will fire this opposite one. You can see that that is why the docking procedure was so slow. It takes time, like our computers are very fast. The thrusters are like still, you know, clunky. So we need better throttle. Now, hydrazine, 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 I keep saying about that and it's very carcinogenic, very dangerous and all that. So is there a uh, replacement for that? Well, uh, the biggest replacement have been testing right now. It's NH3OHNO3. I have no idea what the heck it's called. Uh, basically, it's a green propellant. If you are seeing uh, a green propellant infusion mission that was done with SpaceX and NASA, this uh, spacecraft that was launched recently, uh, that is what it's carrying. Basically, again, this is one part of it. This is the majority part, and they mix whatever they need with glycol or uh, other aspect so it, they can increase the performance or increase the stability because, again, it has to be in space. It must be stable for a long enough time. And you can see this can be handled by a human. If it spills on you, you're not gonna die. If it is uh, basically hydrazine, you will be dead by cancer itself, or simply it will corrode through you. 
so future is basically we want to make this thing stable so if you dock something let's say a bfr or something like that and you can be like okay chill it's gonna be there for like you know two three years so this was my presentation on reaction control system i hope you liked it learn from it in that case please click a like button if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it i'd urge you to press dislike press it twice to show me your extra disappointment and please leave a comment because i reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you're free and as always thanks for watching